In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO, SDSU Extension, for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. A series of two local events were held in South Dakota, in Lemon and Fort Pierre. Well, I'm a captive audience in South Dakota, and how many have ever been to Garrison, South Dakota? One, two, three, four. Well, that, you know, that's kind of like me. I've only been to Lemon three times. So we live in the same state and we don't know each other. And, and, and I, I think that speaks to the diversity in our state. And I, I just love it. Uh, our, our state has so much to offer and, and, and experience. And, and so, yeah, I was asked to uh, come and talk about interpreting soil tests and so forth. And that last question I asked uh, Dr. Lehman and, 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 and Dwayne chimed in on that. It, it, it's a kind of a serious issue because uh, these soil test recommendations are going to, I'm going to show you, tell you you should put on phosphorus at different soil test levels. And, and, and what I'm hearing is if we're in a long-term no-till situation and we have soil microbiology and, and fungi in the soil, we can, we can tend to keep those soil test levels lower. And so that suggests that there's a, a set of different calibrations for no-till and, and, and we don't have that. And, uh, so what I'm going to do is go through and, and, and discuss what we do have, and, and, um, and we'll call it that. But uh, it's a very intriguing uh, thought, uh, these long-term no-till soils. Um, so what, what are the reasons for soil sampling? There's several of them. Um, obviously, to determine the current nutrient status of the soil. Um, helps you determine ac more accurate nutrient application rates. Keeps you from losing yield, from uh, you know having under application of nutrients or soil test levels, prevents over application, saves saves you money. Uh, provides the ability to track soil nutrient trends over time. I'm going to show you a graph about that from from my farm. Um, soil soil cost testing is is minimal compared to the cost of fertilizer, isn't it? It's just the time and finding someone to go out and get it done. Is, is kind of the, the hard part there. Um, it's a tool used in site-specific soil management, grid sampling, zone sampling, um, diagnosing problems. That's the next one there, number eight. If you have an area in a field that's got a plant health problem, it could be nutrient related and, and soil testing and plant tissue testing help you to do that. And then the last one on the list, we do have to realize that we live in a world with other folks. And, and we call those everyone a stakeholder. Everyone has, a, has input and is concerned about our environment and our planet. And so protecting the environment, using soil testing to do that is, is, is an excellent way to, to help do that. So the soil nutrient trend part, uh, Here's my farm, uh, soil test phosphorus over, over a lengthy period of time, way back to 93. Um, it's an average of all fields that were tested for each one of those years. And you can see that, well, this is a big drop, but I only soil test half of my fields every year. So this half had a little bit higher test than that half. And then it kind of, so this, this, this half here is again appearing here, and then it's appearing here and here. But the overall trend is, is what? It's up. Soil testing is not perfect. You have field variability. When you take a sample one year and you go back and sample it again the next year, there's variability. Where do those cores come from? So you have that variability. And then you have laboratory variability too. Labs aren't perfect. Each test has a, has a variability that, that they know. Um, some tests are, have less variability in the lab than others. For instance, the sulfur test has huge variability. It's really not a very good test, but, but we still can use it as a tool. The zinc test is really accurate in the lab. You can, you can repeat those numbers over and over. So when you take into account the variability, seeing trends like this doesn't surprise me. And, and maybe it does surprise you, but, but that, that happens. And so the importance of, of tracking over time where you're headed is, is a really good really good tool to do. And I'm going to discuss phosphorus later, but, but you know, we really want to manage our fields in that medium range, 10 to 12. And I'll 
discuss the probabilities of a response to phosphorus application so you understand that. But just, just kind of keep that in your mind, that 10, 12, maybe 14 part per million range. <clears throat> there are two types of soil tests. There's ones that provide absolute values and ones that are related to an index. Ones that are absolute values are the nitrate, nitrogen, sulfur, and chloride, where we measure the amount of nutrient at the time of sampling. And that can change with, with uh, water movement through the soil, uh, microbial activity releasing more nitrogen and sulfur, and things like that. So those are the, um, the mobile nutrients that are reported in absolute values. You have so many pounds per acre. The ones that are related to indexes are, are basically the non-mobile nutrients. Uh, those used to be reported in pounds per acre, but that was changed a oh, ways back, 15, 20, 25 years ago, because it was confusing. A grower would say, I have 15 pounds of phosphorus in my soil. Well, you really don't. But, but that's the way the test was reported. And, and so it was switched back to a concentration report in part per million. And that, that uh, concentration is related to an index where the soil fertility researchers went out to a number of fields and sampled the soil, measured the phosphorus, and then applied rates of phosphorus and looked at where the responses were coming. And so that response is related back to an index, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. First of all, I want to air this out. Uh, the soil testing labs, uh, we have two in South Dakota right now. Uh, there's one that just started in Artesian called Ag Vision. And Daryl Denicky, I don't know, maybe some of you know his name. He, he uh, reti retired from SDSU, and, and he's managing that lab. Ag Lab Express in Sioux Falls is the one I helped start for a couple of years when I had my midlife crisis. Uh, I, left, I left the university and, and helped them do that, which was a good experience. Then there's AgVise Labs, we're in Benson, Minnesota, Northwood, North Dakota, War Labs in Kearney, Nebraska, and Midwest Labs in Omaha. And there's a whole bunch more. But these are the ones I think that I wanted to mention because they're really close, close to us in, in South Dakota. So given that, I'm going to show you a soil test report form. And I tried to hide the name up here, but you can see what it is. But, but anyway, that's why I showed you the slide of all the labs. I don't want to be biased and, and say one lab is better than another. Uh, I, I just um, want to make that clear. So you get back a soil test report form from the lab, and you look at that and all that fine print, and you go, what does all this mean? And, and you know, it, it's really difficult to, to understand for, for some folks. But basically, a soil test report form is, is I've divided into five areas. And, and uh, the first area is just the general soil information, you know, who took the sample, for who, when it was taken, what field it is, all that type of stuff. They even give you a map if you want to draw a map. Then you have the laboratory results section and interpretation. You have the other soil test results, organic matter, electrical conductivity, soil pH. Uh, for those that like uh, looking at base saturations, that's, that's in that area too. You have the recommendation section, and then you have statements. That's that fine print at the bottom. And you, you should read those. There's, there's a lot being said there. So I'm going to try to go through each one of those sections and Obviously, I've done this one here, uh, uh, no secrets, just, just a lot of information. And th this is the stuff you have to fill out on the form when you submit your sample. So if you don't put some things on your form when you submit your sample, you're not going to see it back. And so if you haven't kept track of what samples are what, you might be confused a little bit. So, so do a good job of filling out, filling out those forms for the lab. That next section is the, uh, what the lab the nutrient analysis and the interpretation. And I, I've just kind of highlighted it here out. And, and so we have nitrate, nitrogen here, and phosphorus, potassium, chloride, sulfur, boron, zinc, and the rest. <coughs> and so you see the analysis here. There's, 
There's uh, about 48 pounds of nitrate nitrogen in that top two feet. And then they give you an interpretation. They call that low. I honestly don't know where interpretations for nitrate nitrogen come from, but they've, they've kind of just uh, did that. The important thing is, is the interpretation for the rest. I think it just fills in their table here and, and, and it makes it look good. But, but the interpretations for phosphorus and potassium really mean something. That's that index, okay? So you can see that phosphorus is in medium here, and, and I'll talk about that in a little bit uh, uh, in the future here. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the nitrogen part. In South Dakota, we use a rate calculator. Um, it's the yield goal, which is very important. You have to do everything in this calculator the way we recommend or that calculator falls apart. Okay, so the yield goal is very important. Take your field, look at the last five to ten years, throw out highs and lows, take the average times 1.10, 110 percent or 115 percent because yields are going up, aren't they? We're getting better at managing our fields, more technology. That's how you come up with a decent yield goal. You don't say I want 250 bushel corn every year. And I think that's where, I'm, you know, this has been used the wrong way. The yield goal is past history times an improvement factor. Then we have an end coefficient, and these are the coefficients that we currently have, 1.2 on corn, 2.5 on wheat, and, and so forth. Uh, the reason soybeans and alfalfa are on this list, we know that we don't need to fertilize those crops with nitrogen, but if you're a large animal feeding operation, and you have a lot of manure to get rid of, you can apply nitrogen to those two crops and get rid of your nitrogen if, if that's what you want to do. It's not probably a good economic choice, but it's being done. And then we subtract soil test nitrogen. That's what we just seen right here, that 48 pounds per acre. And uh, we uh, uh, subtract other credits, like a legume credit. I'll show you the table for that. And then we, we our current recommendations say we add 30 pounds back for no-till. Um, well, there's a lot of questions with that one. How long have you been no-tilling? We, we really don't know when that should go away. We're working on that a little bit, and I have a graph to kind of point in the direction. But the reason for adding that nitrogen back is that when you switch to no-till, you're, you're, you're really immediately building carbon back in the soil. And that carbon to nitrogen ratio in the soil wants to, to uh, uh, settle on a ratio. And so you, it, it's requiring some nitrogen as well. So at some point, that carbon to nitrogen ratio will even out, if you will. And, and this 30 pounds extra for no-till should go away. It shouldn't be needed anymore. But then if you start pushing cover crops again, you're going to push your, your carbon again. And so that balance is really uh, hard to get at. But, but we got some data that, that kind of shows that. Here's the legume credits. Soybeans is 40. Uh, alfalfa here, depending upon the stand, uh, uh, really dictates the credit. And, and if you're no-tilling, we cut those credits in half because you're not oxidizing the soil. You're not mineralizing nitrogen out of the organic matter. You're building it up. So we take less of a credit uh, when we're no-tilling. And hence, the second year, we also cut, cut that in half, too, uh, from the time we take the first credit. So here are the two studies we did on, on no-till, where we had, had till, tilled systems side-by-side, side, randomized side-by-side side with nitrogen rates applied randomize across that. That's a very difficult study to do. But, but we had a couple of sites that we could use. Here are the yield response curves given the different nitrogen rate across the bottom. And you could see that the, uh, um, the no-till curve is, is coming to its uh, a peak there at a little bit later time than the conventional till. And by golly, we had two, two of these studies that were, were going for six, seven, eight years. And, and and the difference is about 30 pounds. And so that's where that 30 pounds came from. 
At this time, we did this. You know, we thought, well, boy, that's been a no-till quite a while, and really that wasn't true. You know, we've got no-tillers now 20, 20 to 25 years. And so this is, this is really short-term no-till. So the question is, when can we stop, you know, adding that 30 pounds? Well, we found a graduate student, and we have a site at the Southeast Farm that's been in it about 24 years, and, and, and she's working on that. And, uh, and this last year, they had an early and late season hybrid planted, and then the two tillage systems in the two-year rotation. They also have a three-year. I'm kind of lucky to get this data. I feel privileged. But, but, but anyway, um, there's four response curves there. Um, the yellow and the green are the no-till, and the red and the blue or black or the conventional till. First thing that you can see is the response curves for the no-till are more steep, aren't they? So we're getting greater efficiency to nitrogen application in the no-till uh, with those lower rates because we're not doing that tillage and we're not mining that soil organic matter with the tillage. But what's really interesting is where they're, they're peaking out. It, they appear to be at the same place. So maybe uh, when, 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 uh, when she gets done with her study and analyzing this data, maybe we can come up with a recommendation that for longer term no-till that adding 30 pounds goes away. And so I think this data really, really shows that that, we kind of thought that's the way it was, you know, the, you know, the science would say that, but, but really uh, we need to have the data and I think that's what this is saying. So the end coefficient history in South Dakota has been this. In 75, it was 1.4 for corn, 82, 13, 91, 1.2. We missed 2001. And so coming to 2015, we've done some work, and I'm going to show you a little bit of those results, and, and I think it probably can change again. But I, I, I do talk in other parts of the state, and in, in the rest of the north central region is using a, a price ratio approach, and I... I try to sell the fact that our calculator gives you more flexibility. There's more inputs to put in it. It's more farm specific, if you will, field specific. Where the price ratio approach is, they take all the studies, combine them together, and then you change the price of corn and the price of fertilizer, and it gives you a rate. The point I was trying to make is the difference when you change those prices isn't a lot. We're talking less, less than 10 pounds. And so, Hence that our calculator really gives you more flexibility. It's more input. You have to do a lot more work than just going to a table on the internet and filling in your numbers. But, but our calculator, I think, gives you more flexibility. So in 2013 and 14, we had these sites uh, for corn in South Dakota, red being no-till, yellow being conventional till. These are the response curves for 2013 which look really messy. That's the way nitrogen data looks. Some respond, some don't. And that's part of, part of how, how uh, nitrogen dynamics work. But what we're looking for is an optimal end rate at each one of those sites. And so this is a site from Brown County. This is the yield response curve. You can see here at, at, at no nitrogen, we got 126 bushels. And up here at 120 pounds, we got 177 bushels. So a nice response. Uh, what we do is we do a linear plateau calculation where we essentially these yields up here are not, they're not different from each other. There's a different number there, but when you do statistics convert, comparing the replicated data, they're not different. So we, we draw a linear function here on the responsive part of the curve and we draw the plateau of where those two meet, we come up with about 98 pounds uh, of N was the optimal N rate at that site in that year. And then we do our calculations, and so the coefficient was just over one. So we did that with all of those sites in 2013 and 14. And in 2013, our coefficient averaged one. You can see the great variability there. And then that's just the way it is. Um, certain factors would, uh, would uh, play into that. You really need end rate studies on your farm every year. And we can't do that. 
you know, some farmers probably can figure that out, but, but we try to get as many sites out there to get this coefficient as strong as possible. 2014, fewer sites, uh, all of them no-till, same coefficient, about one. And then if you look at no-till and conventional till, the coefficients are the same. So I think we can go from 1.2 to 1. If we look at the phosphorus on the soil test recommendations, I mentioned that interpretation is kind of important. Uh, Dr. Malarino from Iowa State, the phosphorus and potassium leader, I think, in the country, says we do a disservice by putting a number on the soil test report form. But you paid for that, and you want to see your results, don't you? It's really all about the interpretation. What level are you at? Are you at very low, low, medium, or high, or very high? That's really what the recommendation is based upon. And so if you look at phosphorus and potassium interpretations, uh, either for Olson P or Bray P, a medium test Olson is the same as a medium test Bray. And we get these arguments as you get closer to Minnesota and Iowa. Some grow, oh, you got to do Bray, you got to do Bray, you got to do Bray. Yeah, they can't under, you get a higher number with Bray than you get with Olson. But it's measuring the same thing. It's measuring that soil's ability to, plot, to uh, uh, supply the plant with phosphorus is really what it's doing. And so if you're in the very low category, which is this range, 0 to 5 for Bray, 0 to 3 for Olson, there's greater than an 80% chance you will get a yield response if you apply phosphorus. If you're in the low, it's about 60 to 80. The medium is 40 to 60. High, 20 to 40. And if you're in the very high category, there's less than a 20% chance. Okay, so it's really about this index. It's related back, back to that. And if you think about the size of the response, this 80% chance of response, those responses are usually a lot larger than the ones you get if you get a response if you're in the very high category. Okay, so now we have lower commodity prices. Doesn't seem like fertilizer prices are coming down to, to meet those levels, but they have a little bit. Um, this really is important. It's important all the time. But it seems when there's more cash out there, we tend to buy more insurance and, and, and so uh, this is one thing that, that uh, we can use to manage better. Here are those uh, uh, corn responses to that phosphorus index. Uh, 197 sites in South Dakota. I have added in a few from surrounding states for a total of 261 sites. Uh, if you're in that very low category, a number above 100 is a response to phosphorus application. There's that greater than 80% chance of a response. You go to low, those, those dots aren't as high, as they? Aren't as high. So larger responses, still a lot of responses, but getting lower. You go to medium, a lot smaller responses, fewer responses. You go to high, hardly any deviation from that 100, which is, is a relative, relative mark where uh, the check plot and the plot you applied phosphorus to had relatively equal yield. And then you go to very high and what do you see? Hardly any responses and then the magnitude is really small. Okay, so that, that's where that index comes from. Very low, low, medium, high is all these, all these tests that were done. And this is historic. This just isn't in the last few years. This is in the last 30, 40 years, maybe 50 years. Here's a study we did at the Northeast Farm, long-term study, started way back in the 90s, uh, where we have plots where we put on all nutrients, NPK and zinc, plots we just hold off N, plots we just hold off P and so forth. And over time, we've drawn down that soil test phosphorus level. It's at a 1 ppm Olson. The yield is 114 bushels. Where we had all the nutrients, it was 153 bushels. So a huge response and a high probability. 
Here's the soybean response to the phosphorus index, basically the same as the corn. Basically the same thing. We had spring wheat plots at, 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 at the northeast farm, same thing, where we apply all the nutrients, hold off one in the presence of the others. Uh, where the soil test, where phosphorus hasn't been applied for many, many years, the soil test is at five. And you can see the response. 78 bushels where we had phosphorus, 49 where we didn't. You can also see those other plots that had phosphorus, the variability in the soil test is real, the sampling and the testing, because they should all be about roughly the same, except for the no end. Our yields on the no end have been reduced too, so we're not as removing as much phosphorus, so that test is higher. But uh, uh, you can kind of see the trend there um, for those other nutrients. There's no response. Uh, in the first part of this study, there was tillage, but they've been no-till for the largest part of the study. And that's still going at the Northeast Farm. I'm, I'm fighting to keep it going, but it, it's, we had it going last year. Okay, I'm going to go to the non-nutrient uh, mineral soil test results section. I know it's small. Sorry for the small screen today, but, but we have organic matter there, which, which is an important test. Track that over time. Uh, your salts, soluble salts here, uh, and then pH. I'm going to discuss those as well. Um, you can see that on my farm, I don't look at the base saturation. Um, it's just there because folks, folks are driving the system and they want that test, so the lab, the lab provides it. Here's a response of organic matter in, a, in an eroded landscape. Uh, when you're down around two, we're getting about 100 to 125 bushels, and you get up at over four, it's about 175 bushels. So organic matter, very important. You can also use that organic matter, you know, on some of our chemical labels have restrictions. And so you can use it, use it for those decisions as well. Soil pH, um, long-term studies at Brookings. Looking at crop response, this is corn to soil pH. We see here about 5.6, 5.7. Um, the yield differences aren't that great above that point, but below they are. And so our recommendations I hope that's the next one, yeah, um, are related to a buffer index. And what a buffer soil test does is it really is uh, stressing, I always say stressing, but it, it's really looking at the reserve alkalinity in the soil. Soils are constantly weathering. Um, and so is that soil going to release more alkalinity and that pH go up, or isn't there as much alkalinity there and that pH going to stay the same? Well, so that we do a buffer to kind of test that or stress that soil, I like to say. And so when we're above buffer index of 6.5, it's just a pH measurement, but we've added a buffer to the soil solution and just measured pH. So above 6.5, no lime wrecks. And if you, as you go down or the buffer index goes down, then that lime wreck goes up. Electrical conductivity interpretation, you know, if you're farming where there's some salt in the landscape and, you know, all what we're talking about today, cover crops and everything, really help to reduce that, use, use your water more efficiently. But we do have some areas, and so that electrical conductivity is used to diagnose those. An exchangeable sodium percentage as well to see if those salts contain, contain sodium. Then you got the recommendation part of the soil test report form. Uh, this lab provides three crop choices, so you can play around a little bit. Uh, you know, put different crops in there or put the same crop with different yield goals. But if you've done a good job at determining your yield goal, you really shouldn't need different yield goals. You should go with the one you've determined, right? Um, you can choose, some labs have what they call the university recommendations and then some labs have their own. And you really gotta understand, ask a lot of questions to those labs, well, how are you developing your recommendations? You know, why, why, would, why would your lab recs be, this P and K maintenance is a good example, why would they be higher than the university ones? And they'll give you their answer. But I would go back to the fact that the university ones are based upon 
stuff like this. Lots of data. Okay? Based upon lots of data. So that's the recommendation portion, and, and you know those 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 labs have all these X Y Z plus two minus three packages, and you have to figure out which ones to check. <laughs> Do I need sulfur? Do I need zinc? Okay, and I'll, I'll point you in the right direction on some of that here. But uh, they give you give you that rec in pounds per acre of of that nutrient that's in that equivalent in that fertilizer. So reviewing these soil tests and nutrient recommendations is really important. So there's a difference, or there can be differences between university recs and someone else's uh, recommendations. And I would point you to our, our EC750 publication, um, our fertilizer recommendation guide. It's stored on the web right there, but basically if you Google SDSU soil fertility EC750, it'll come up top of the list. You don't have to write all that down. If you can just remember that, that, that search and you can get it there. That guide needs to be updated really bad. Um, I am not the soil fertility faculty person on campus. We don't currently have one. And so I think one of the duties for that new person will be to take a look at this, I hope. So how do you tell the difference between what a, a lab rec would be and what a university rec would be is, is, is well, you go to EC750. Here's the phosphorus table for wheat. Uh, here's that index, uh, soil test levels there, very low to very high. Um, they do have, a, we have a yield, yield goal there, and you can, you can see what the recommendation would be. Or if you want to hone in really tight, every table has an equation, and you can put your numbers into that equation. So you can discern between a university rec and a lab rec. Sometimes they won't give you a lab, a university rec. So, so use that EC750 for that. And then the statements portion on, on a soil test report form. Um, caution, seed place fertilizer can cause injury. Nitrogen credits granted here. Um, uh, they have crop removal information. Um, they explain what their broadcast and maintenance guidelines do. So you don't necessarily have to ask this lab. They explain what they do. Well, I'm going to hone in on that seed place fertilizer statement there. Um, Ron, Dr. Gelderman, I think is, is really one of the highlights of his career, 42 years at STSU. He did a lot of work at, at evaluating different crops with different amounts and types of fertilizer placed in the furrow. Um, did a lot of work with that, and this is the results uh, from, from that study. Uh, this is wheat, and so you can see three, three fertilizer materials here, urea, potash, and uh, DAP, diammonium phosphate, um, 18460, I think that, that's what that is. And uh, the rate of the fertilizer material, and then its effect on relative stand. So where we didn't put any fertilizer with this seed, we got 100% stand or close to it. And then as we started applying uh, DAP with the seed at higher rates, you can see what happened to stand, okay? Well, different fertilizers have different effects on, on seed germination. Urea is really hard on it right here. Here's that curve. And potash and, and DAP being about the least. and, and and there's all kinds of more uh, information that, that Ron did in those studies. And uh, you can get the, uh, the uh, spreadsheet to help you look at different materials and different crops at uh, the Soil Fertility website. Um, it's called the Fertilizer Seed Decision Aid. Um, and so there's a spreadsheet there that you can, you can get at to look at that. It's kind of interesting. So with that, I'm done. Am I early? Just a little bit? Okay. I had a, had a bunch of slides. It's always hard to tell how many to throw in, and, and that's what I had today. So if there's any questions, I can try to answer them. If not, what do you got planned? I'll get a break now. So. Okay. Okay.
Yes, that's a really good question because in EC750, okay, yeah, is there a place to know or check uh, whether you need boron for your crop or zinc for your crop? And in the EC750, if you go like to zinc, it'll discuss which crops you should be concerned about for zinc. It'll discuss boron. It'll discuss calcium and those things. So you can get that information out of EC750. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's going to be around? Sure. Or 